In the last lecture, we looked at several things. Railroad routes, as of 1948, showing how in Iowa internally was all connected, all parts were connected to Des Moines, but also how many railroads crossed Iowa without going through Des Moines, generally to connect the state to Chicago. We looked at the county level map, noticing the rectangular shape of most counties and also the names of counties, though only identified Indian and presidential names. We'll get to others later. We looked at a map used by the Geological Survey to identify impaired waters, which flow generally diagonally across the state, while the map used the county borders to establish regions. We looked again at the ecological regions of Iowa, at the rivers that flow from the southern part of the state into Missouri, and finally at the towns that are home to the six offices of the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, seeing that they are all on or near rivers. The underlying message has to do with the importance of rivers, but the organization of the state by counties. And I can't emphasize that enough, that uh, rivers are tremendously important to Iowa as uh, uh, drainage for uh, farms, uh, but also recreation for citizens, and uh, just uh, you know, scenic places where, uh, that we kind of enjoy just looking at. Uh, they're not... Uh, sometimes uh, they are good for um, canoeing and uh, maybe uh, rafting, although not too many of them are rapid. But we, uh, you know, we are really defined by an awful lot of rivers in our state, and uh, yet the counties are all rectangular and very, uh, you know, very uniform. So now we're looking at the tourist regions of Iowa, of which there are ten instead of six, as on the survey map. Now, why would they have ten instead of six? Well, they are right through the middle of the state, with um, three of them called Central, West Central, East Central, um, and just Central. And then there's just plain East. So that kind of uh, you know, adds uh, four more sections. For tourist regions, it's not very descriptive. I mean, just directional. They're all directional. So they're not really that interesting. But it does provide that sense of direction. And why would there be so many with such different sizes? For the sake of tourism, clusters of tourist attractions give meaning to the map. East Central, for instance, would include Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, while East includes Davenport and Dubuque. Central includes Des Moines and Ames. This map is from the website resortbay.com, which lists bed and breakfast locations, about half a dozen in each region. So you could go to this site, see a map of the USA, click on a state, and then click on regions within the state and find full information for the bed and breakfast establishments in that region. However, I suggest that you call ahead and make sure they're still operating. But the map is not as wedded to county lines, county boundaries, as the geological survey map. There are plenty of straight lines, but there are a lot of uh, diagonal and sort of uh, odd shapes uh, around in there too. So it's, it's not just defined by counties. Now take a look at this next map. Oh, let's make it big. There we go. Here's the map of um, the AEAs, the Area Education Association throughout the state. Do these co follow county lines? Well, no, I don't think so. They're all, those are rectangular. These are all kinds of different uh, angles and shapes and little bumps and squiggles here and there. Now uh, look at AEA, that little, uh, pointy part that goes up into Keystone AEA. What's that all about? I think it would be find, hard to find a county line that coincides with any of these borders. And how many of them are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we had uh, six for the impaired waters, ten for tourist regions, and now we have nine for AEAs. And why is that? Well, let's look at the next one. There's AEAs together with the county lines, and uh, I sort of, you, know, you might be able to find a line that follows a county like between Cherokee and Buena Vista or Ida and Sac, that's pretty close, but most of them cut right through, and I'm down about Marion and Lucas and Monroe in the southern part of the state, maybe that follows a county line or story. So there are some, but a lot of them, like in the Grantwood AEA, cuts right through Tama, right through Powashik, right through um, kind of around into Washington, Keokuk, Cedar County is divided, Jones County is not all in, all in it, you know, Lynn County, almost all of it is in, but uh, they really do not follow county lines very well. Now, uh, 
so what's going on? I think the next slide will help us understand this, but first consider the names of the areas. Hey, they're descriptive, different from the geological survey or the tourist maps. Great Prairie, ah, that's nice. Um, and that's sort of the, uh, that, that um, region that I mentioned on the earlier map, uh, I think it was uh, number 40. Mississippi Bend, and that's a nice romantic sort of name, and there it is, there's the bend, it's very descriptive. Uh, key, romantic, uh, or Keystone. It builds on the name for uh, Dubuque. The Keystone City was named because of its location between Milwaukee and Chicago and the cities on Missouri, such as Council Bluffs or Sioux City, and also its north, south, and east, west railroads. So it was a real crossing point uh, in a lot of ways. Um, Prairie Lakes up in the north emphasizes the Great Lakes region of Iowa, epitomized by Lake Okoboji but also including Spirit and Storm Lakes. So the Prairie Lakes. Um, heartland is a term often used for the Midwest, with Des Moines picking up on the theme as the heart of the heartland. Um, Northwest is, again, it's about the only one in here that's a, just a direction. Uh, so you have Northwest, Northwest of something, I guess relative to the center of the state. And 267 is the only numerical name combination of what were once areas AEAs 2, 6, and 7. Grant Wood is the only one named for a person, an artist who taught in Cedar Rapids and in Iowa City and established a Depression-era artist colony in Stone City um, near Anamosa in Jones County. Now, how many AEAs are there currently? Nine, but they were originally, there were 16. And uh, some of them uh, do go by names like uh, Prairie Lakes, AEA. It's a nice name, but it's also AEA 8, which is simply 3 and 5 added together. Um, so they, sometimes you'll see them with just numbers. Now we'll look at a map of these school districts. Look at that. There used to be lots more school districts, but this is still quite a plethora of them. It's a real jigsaw map. Uh, this map shows the ones that are impoverished in the darkest colors. So if you look at it, you see down in the south, there are some very impoverished ones, but even uh, more impoverished up here and, and over here, kind of isolated from other impoverished. You know, around them, they're not impoverished. And around them, they're, uh, they're kind of poor, but they're not the most poor. But down here, there's a whole string of them that are among the poorest in the state. Now, do these uh, follow county lines? Well, maybe there are a few straight lines in here. They might be county lines, but in general, they're not county lines. They're just jig jigging and jagging all over the place. I've tried to find out how these borders got established, but uh, they, I couldn't find a historian in the Iowa Department of Education who knew. Uh, there are several factors, and some of which are revealed in previous maps we've looked at particularly the one showing elevations. But one showing rivers and streams would help also. And I think, see the rivers and streams, if you were to superimpose this map on the map of uh, school districts, you might find that there's some parallels. And I think uh, up in the corner, if you take a look at there and here, I think uh, if we go back to it, we'll see that you know, that could well be right in here. And then over here, it looks like a, a river. So in some cases, uh, rivers are make boundaries. And that would make sense uh, because when they established school districts back in the 19th century, um, you know, kids, uh, there weren't a lot of bridges and kids didn't ha want to have to cross a stream to get to a school. But there were other, other factors at play. Um, and there are a couple of books that I want to mention. One is called Call School. Uh, because when they would um, you know, they want to start school, they'd go out and they'd call school, and kids would come in from the playground. The subtitle of it is, is Rural Education in the Midwest to 1918. The author is Paul Theobald. He wrote it in 1995. And another one that's pretty interesting is There Goes the Neighborhood, Rural School Consolidation at the Grassroots in the Early 20th Century, uh, David R. Reynolds. Uh, one of my professors at the University of Iowa wrote that in 1999. He's retired now, but, uh, but he was looking at school consolidation, which was quite a big issue 
um, beginning in the 20s, and it still is an issue as we uh, continue the process of consolidation. So we'll go back to the uh, looking at the, so we looked at the rivers, but I want to look at the crazy quilt some more here. Um, factors to consider are early laws of the state required one section of the 36 sections in each township to be reserved for a school. So there were from 12 to 20 one-room schools in each county, one school for each township. And some, some counties had 12 townships, others had 20 townships, and some in between. Rectangularity, thus, was not just a feature of the counties, but even more of the sections and the townships in each county. The schools in these townships were generally one-room schoolhouses, as I mentioned, for a whole range of students. There might be a dozen students in one school, depending on the day, and they might range from four-year-olds to 17-year-olds. They had to be built so students could get them easily, which means not crossing, crossing rivers or streams and not being far from home. Uh, there were a lot of political considerations about where the school would be put. Prominent families would want it near their home. Uh, somebody um, who had land might uh, donate land for it. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that uh, led to the, the location of various schools. But rivers and streams would be one factor. So since the 1920s, school and consolidation has been a big issue in the state. And transportation, of course, improved as people had cars and the road system was more developed. Bridges made streams less likely to be barriers, except perhaps in flood season when it was a severe flood. But the original pattern has persisted, leaving the state with a very irregular pattern of school districts and great disparities in attendance, with some school districts having fewer than 300 students Others have in them in the thousands. Efforts to create countywide school districts have met with local resistance, as schools are centers of memory, pride, hope, and commitment for, from generation to generation. Schools are places, and uh, that's a specific kind of meaning of place, which I'll get to a little bit later. Thus, the loss of a local school is a matter of grief, as it means a loss of traditions. And if you're seeing the paper occasionally, they get a group of students from uh, some rural school that closed down 50 years ago and they get them together to have a reunion and see how many are still alive and kicking and uh, glad to get together and uh, remember the other students who uh, moved away or died. Now this map also shows the most impoverished school districts in green. Uh, it's the first map we look at that shows economic data. So where are the poorest school districts? Well, I kind of put them out already. Along the southern tier, up in the northeast, there are several uh, poor school districts. The wealthiest are around the largest cities. So it's uh, around in Des Moines, but the center of it might be a poor area in the middle of Des Moines. But around it are, are wealthier school districts. Um, the western counties along the Iowa's Continental Divide, which is the ridge that separates the Mississippi from the Missouri River is another area of uh, you know, relatively poor school districts, this whole area in through here. Um, and they, they've also been an area of steady population loss over the past century. And population, the demography and population is another topic that I want to develop in, uh, in coming weeks, but uh, not today. Oops. <laughs> 